We were just welcoming everyone into the room with music courtesy of the NPH Spotify playlist, which we created, filled it with songs that were motivating us, inspiring us, or just a reflection of how we were feeling um, coming into 2020. And um, I couldn't ask for a better song to move us into this meeting with History Has Its Eyes on You. And in this moment, um, what we do right now and how we um, activate and engage on our issue. We just have so much opportunity and so much need. And so I'm really excited to have you all here um, to talk about some of the strategies and tactics that um, has come from all of this work leading up to this moment. And um, the only thing I would challenge from that song is um, Lynn manuel Miranda sings at one point, you can't control your own story. And I think that we do think that that is a strategy and a tactic available to us to tell our story and tell it. And we're back, starting off our session with a technical challenge, just for fun. Um, we can tell our story contrary to what Lynn manuel Miranda sang in that song, and we can do it in a meaningful, impactful, strategic way. And I'm so excited to welcome you all here to talk about um, the work that we've been doing and where we've been leading up to. Um, so just to start the day, uh, my name is Alina Harway. I'm the Communications Director at the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. Um, and i um, really excited to have been working with the Shift the Narrative Initiative for over the past 18 months. And um, as we start our session today, I wanna flag a couple of things. I know we've all been doing work from home for a while. I don't imagine this is anyone's first Zoom webinar, um, but there's a few things particular to how we're running our meeting and our session today and how we wanna use the tools available to us today. Um, the first is I really want to flag and encourage and remind you all that you will get from this session what you put into it. We are about to review the product of over a year of research, field experience, practitioner perspective and workshopping and coordinated uh, narrative research projects. And that is a lot to unpack. And it's a lot to unpack in this moment, this moment that can be challenging and difficult and feel incredibly overwhelming at times. And I hear and know from partners and allies the challenges we face in how much work there is and how critical the work is, there is and how passionate and how much we care about the work and yet how hard and under capacity we can feel in this moment. And that is actually exactly why we encourage you to lean in for this time chunk you set aside today. We would not ask this time from you if we did not believe this was the moment and the opportunity to make progress on all that work. And that if we didn't believe that this was the tool and strategy that can really help us do that in a meaningful, impactful, strategic, coordinated way. So I'd like to invite you to first take a breath, close out that tab you have open there. I see you multitaskers, I'm normally one of you, and just really be here with us for this session. Um, and I see some comments in the chat box, contrary to my thought that this is no one's first Zoom session, it is for some. So allow me to point out a couple of the tools here. You'll see, and a lot of you are using already, the uh, chat box available to you. Um, I really want to encourage you to use that. Start the session by saying hi. We have hundreds of organizers, communication staff, policy professionals, affordable housing developers, so many different diverse folks who are coming to this meeting. So tell us who you are. Tell us what brings you here today. Tell us what you hope to get out of this moment. Please do see at the bottom, there's a little drop down menu. You can chat just to panelists. Hi, I see, all, I see all these comments coming in. Or if you would please switch that over so that you're making sure that you're chatting all panelists and all attendees, because the other folks here really want to see and hear from you as well. And this will allow you throughout the session to um, share your reactions, feedbacks, and ideas with everyone and really create some connections. The second um, tool I'll point out to you is there's a QA box at the bottom of your screen or phone or tablet. That is a place where you're gonna drop in specific questions you want addressed about the content we're reviewing today. Um, there's, as you can see, there's a lot going on in the chat box and so make sure we don't lose sight of an important question that you're asking. Um, if you put that in the QA box, that's gonna be the best way to make sure that we can lift it up and see it when we get to the QA section of this meeting. 
And if you're running into technical difficulties, that might be a time when you would switch just to chat with the panelist. Um, or if you're having more, um, more challenging items, you can email my colleague Verna, V-E-R-N-A, at nonprofithousing.org, and she can help you out um, as our local resident um, Zoom guru. So as these chats continue to roll in, um, I'm actually, I'm going to, at this point, invite Ryan Nicole Austin to join me um, to help ground today's session and offering some um, really specific direct application and impact of the work that's been unfolding. Thank you, Alina. Thank you so much. I hope Ryan, everybody- I may, Can I give your bio first? I paused. Oh, go for it. Which is it. a go natural place for you to jump in, but I want folks, I think a lot of people know you, but I want folks to know you who, who don't. I'm going to disappear. Go for it. <laughs> Ryan is the, uh, oh, we can come see your face while I'm talking about you. Ryan's the development director at Eastside Arts Alliance. She's an artist. She's one of our leaders on the Bay Area Narrative Shift Initiative and has been bringing really critical perspectives around the intersection of art and activism. Um, Ryan has been featured on ESPN, TED Talks. She's performed for Google, Sony, LinkedIn, Apple, and Barack Obama, just to drop that one in there. And of course, most importantly, she's here today performing and presenting to us. So with no further ado, Ryan. Thank you again, Alina. And uh, thank you everybody who's here. Thank you NPH for inviting me today. Um, again, my name's Ryan. Um, I am an artist and I am here representing Eastside uh, Arts Alliance. Um, we are an Oakland-based organization we're an organization of third world artists, uh, cultural workers, community organizers of color, committed to working in the San Antonio district, which is a neighborhood in Oakland um, and other Oakland neighborhoods to support a creative environment that improves the quality of life for our communities and advocates for progressive systemic social change. Um, I am here to present a project that uh, I've been working on um, for the last several months called Haven. Um, we opened this meeting with music. We all came into the space in art. And we know that uh, campaign communications shift voter sentiments, but media, culture, art shift voter values for the long term. Um, in the vein of some recent innovations um, and cancel rent festival, the movement for black lives, hip hop for black August, we are uh, producing a project called Haven, which is um, similar. It's a virtual concert. Um, Haven is it, well, simply, it's a virtual concert, but uh, the longer explanation is uh, Haven engages our local artists, art makers, media makers, really our cultural wealth um, within Oakland and the, the broader Bay Area to share their work and perspectives on housing justice. Um, Haven also invites community members who are experiencing housing insecurity to offer their testimonies, their expertise, um, just their narratives in imagining a more just community for our, uh, our neighborhoods, our cities, our homes, and our, our broader environments. Uh, today, I'm coming to you very briefly to invite your partnership, to invite your promotional partnership in sharing um, this event and, uh, and, and talking about it that much more. I'm also inviting folks who uh, may have already been producing work uh, be it artistic work, um, be it interviews on the housing justice um, stories, narratives, um, interviews that you may already have. I have a link that uh, Landre, who is here helping us with some of the te technical aspects, will share with you all um, where you can just connect with me directly and we can talk about ways that you can tap in. But the low hanging fruit of uh, Haven, again, which is a virtual concert happening on October 22nd, tentatively, um, is to be a promotional partner, is to share it with all your networks far and wide. Again, it is a, um, an event that galvanizes the voices of artists, of media makers, um, of community members, cultural workers and organizers um, purposed to shift 
the attitudes, the long-term attitudes of voters and values of voters um, towards housing justice. We know that there are ballots, uh, there are, excuse me, are measures and propositions on the ballot. And uh, our hope is that some of this uh, music, some of this art that we're making will shift those attitudes for the short term, November 3rd election, but also this will uh, exist, this campaign and project will exist uh, beyond our November 3rd election. Um, so please uh, share um, your information with me. The bit.ly, uh, the link is bit.ly backslash Haven STN, which is uh, like shift the narrative. Um, and you will see just a short form with some questions as to whether or not you'd be willing to be interviewed, uh, whether or not you are, um, you have pre-existing media that you'd like to share with us and would like shared within the virtual concert context. And again, if you'd be down to be a promo promo promotional partner um, in sharing this concert with your network, it's going to be a powerful show. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to share this work in, in our own creative ways. And that's all I got for you guys. I look forward to hearing more about the playbook and I'll be here to answer any questions, field any comments that you guys have after the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ryan. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful to you for the work you're doing and also for um, really grounding us um, in this conversation around the importance of um, having multi-prong approach to moving narrative through our work, the importance of arts and culture as part of those approaches. And I hope that can really signal the energy and the excitement about the way this work is unfolding and seed ideas for avenues that we can all explore, even those of us who aren't artists and maybe haven't um, coordinated or integrated with arts before can really be looking for ways to strengthen those collaborations and opportunities. So thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you partners, friends, and allies in our work towards housing and racial justice. It's, it's fantastic seeing all of your hellos come in through the chat box. Um, please don't forget, make sure you're sending to all panelists and attendees, not just panelists. I think I'm seeing some really great comments here that others would also like to see. Um, so please make sure you just toggle that blue little um, drop down menu to say to all panelists and attendees. Um, all right, today is the first of our three-part webinar series on the Bay Area Season Narrative Playbook. The results of our months-long coalition-driven research-informed initiative to advance housing and racial justice in the Bay Area. This initiative's work aims to seize this powerful moment to drive new narratives for our movement, offering research-driven and field practice strategies, tactics, and messages. And now you all should have received a copy of the playbook in your inbox this morning. We'll drop a link to that in the chat box here as well. And um, probably your first reaction when you pulled it up is, oh, there's a lot here. Absolutely. This playbook was built from local lay of the land, field analysis, robust local research program, as well as collaboration and coordination with other narrative projects at the state and national level um, to incorporate and embed their research as well. All of this building up to offer concrete guidance on how we can advance housing and racial justice here, locally and regionally, specifically with our Bay Area audiences. I really do wanna take a moment to honor, acknowledge, and thank the leadership team and the collaborative table who have been so deeply engaging in shaping, reviewing, workshopping, testing, and refining this work. East Bay Housing Organizations, Pico California, Working Partnerships USA, Eastside Arts Alliance, Bar High and Rise Together, the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County, ACE, Urban Habitat, Tech Equity, Hamilton Families, Sacred Heart, San Mateo Anti-Displacement Coalition, Monument Impact, Public Advocates, North Bay Organizing Project, the San Francisco Foundation and Great Communities Collaborative, and of course my partners and colleagues at the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California. 
Um, you probably recognize uh, a lot of those names there as your own partners and allies and possibly likely the folks who invited you to join us in this session. And this wouldn't be the first time for some of you. We've had hundreds of individuals from more than 60 organizations participating, weighing in, workshopping, and providing feedback in various capacities during this entire process. And that includes many of you here today. So I want to thank and recognize and acknowledge you as well. Um, and we, as I mentioned before, we have been so grateful to have had the opportunity to coordinate and collaborate closely with other narrative projects. Um, narrative shift has been increasingly growing in prominence as a critical tool and strategy to support the work that we're doing for social justice and racial justice and housing justice. And as we look for how to um, learn from those strategies, embed these strategies, it's been really meaningful to have um, coordinated, uh, collaborative, uh, simultaneous projects unfolding, and that each of these projects committed to sharing their research findings in real times with the um, other projects so that we could all benefit um, from what we were learning in support of our shared vision and narrative goals, even as we recognize that our specific and local audience would require our own localized research and recommendations. And I do encourage you to engage with those other state and national narrative projects as well. And we'll be dropping some links into the chat box on places where you can engage, including um, the CZI Learning Lab opportunity and um, the national uh, work to develop a national strategy um, from the research that they've developed. And as for us today, um, we're so honored to have Dr. Tiffany Manuel who is the CEO and founder of The Case Made and has been a longtime advisor and partner in our Bay Area efforts. Um, today, she is going to walk us through the core recommendations from the playbook. She's going to discuss opportunities in our current environment amid COVID and racial justice and health and education and other points of intersection and opportunity and host ample time for a QA and a conversation with participants here um, that's a lot, and yet there's still more to review. So I really want to make sure that you also are aware of our parts two and parts three on this session. Today, we're reviewing the playbook. In parts two, we're going to dig deep and unearth everything that we found in our research. Those were the findings that an analysis that led to the recommendations in the playbook. So we wanted to start here and then show you um, all of the wonky research pieces. And in part three, where we'll dig in on more practical messages and applications in our work. So please don't forget to register for those there. Before I hand things over to Dr. Manuel, I'm gonna do my best to uh, give justice to this metaphor that Ryan and um, Will from our leadership team developed when we were thinking about what this playbook means for this coalition because as you're seeing in the chat box as you are um, engaging with folks in the the movement and the coalition of course you realize that there are many of us from many walks of life um, and uh, bringing different um, organizational um, missions and on different parts of the spectrum and while we all come here with a commitment to shared values of housing and racial justice our audiences may look different our tactics may look different our very specific policy asks may look different so we were thinking through like how how is this playbook meaningful across that diverse audience and there was this recognition of um, really looking to our current moment and protest culture because when you go to a protest you have that same um, you have that same environment where people are coming together and demanding change and creating change, leading to real policy changes and conversations that are going to ultimately change real system, create real systems change. Folks come to those protests and they are going to all bring their own signs and those signs they're designing individually. It's their unique perspective. It's their truth and their reality. And they come to the protests and they all chant together the the joint chant because that is the fundamental value that everyone there is organizing around it's our hope that this playbook can be that united piece we need a united chant that we can all chant together because when we put that many voices and all of that power behind um, our united uh, cry 
we get attention, we create change. It doesn't um, stop you at all from bringing your own sign and telling your truth in the midst of our bigger shared truth. So this playbook was led by research, workshop by practitioners and informed by field experiences, yet it must be put into practice by you and all of us. So in today's session, I really want to invite you to bring your hardest questions and your, your biggest challenges, as well as your boldest dreams and ideas and, and offer your ideas and avenues for opportunity ahead, because that's what's going to help us really move this forward. Without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to the star of the hour, Dr. Tiffany Manuel. Well, hey, hey now. Thank you very much, Elena. You did a great job on that metaphor. Um, I just want to I just want to call into being that it was Ryan actually uh, during one of our steering committee sessions who lifted up that metaphor and we all had this epiphany. We were trying to figure out how to describe, you know, the difference between messaging and narrative and how to help people navigate those two things. And when she said that metaphor, we were like, yes, yes, that's what we're trying to figure out. That's what we're trying to get people to think about when you have a protest and people are chanting, you know, no justice, no peace. Like that's the overarching messaging that we're all sort of reiter re, you know, reiterating. But the narrative comes in the way that we are, all of our signs, the way you talked about, all, all of the signs that people make as they come to the, to the protest may have different things on them, but they're all embedded. The, the sort of value system that is embedded in that kind of no justice, no peace chant is embedded in the way that people are telling their stories and saying it the way they want to, and using colors and, you know, um, um, their, their ways of having visuals uh, and all of that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, from that perspective, it was great to have Ryan sort of kick us off, you know, talking about both the event and the work that, that she and her organization are working on, because I think it helps us to reinforce this idea that narrative is really not just the press release, because I think, you know, for a lot of us, we, we get sort of in that mode of like, advocacy work, we got to get people to the community meeting, we got to get people to this meeting, we got to get people to sign this petition, we got to get, you know, in front of the legislature to do whatever it is. And we forget that so much of what determines how people think about issues and so much of what determines the power of those narrative narratives actually happens outside of that context. It happens to music and song that we watch on TV and popular culture and the conversations we have with our friends at the water cooler and at the soccer field and the da, 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 you know, it's all those conversations, right, that, that our narratives and our truths, our, our sense of who we are get expressed and communicated. And when those stories that we're telling, right, embed the values that we're going to talk about on this call and, and, and start communicating that out more fully, what happens is we're able to pull people forward and that becomes the culture that we embody. So I, I want to start there. I mean, I think that's the spirit of this work. It's how do you shift those narratives so that even the way that we tell our truth and right has some power packed into it. It's not just that we're telling our story, but we're telling it in a way that connects to powerfully the way that people think about issues and shifting that over time so that um, it gets easier <laughs> to mobilize people because they're leaning into a particular way of being. So I want to just acknowledge um, that, that, that Ryan wasn't just the kind of the opening act here, like she was, she's, she's contributing quite a lot. And I hope that folks really get that this is more than just how do we structure our press releases and those kind of things. I also want to just call out my NPH colleagues who've been working together for a long time on this. I remember when NPH first came early on and said, hey, we want to do this narrative work. We're trying to figure it out and we want to organize you know, researchers around this and a team around this. And I remember in the early days when we were talking about uh, this issue, I was, I was excited, but it was like putting the small pieces together. I think I came, we had an early session at, at like the Green Lining Institute, I think, and got people around and people said, hey, we want some more of that. I mean, it was kind of like this really iterative process that I would say has snowballed into something that is really powerful. In fact, you know, I've been telling our steering committee around this, just how important I think this work is for a couple of reasons. And I, and I will, let me just step back and just, just you know, humor me for a moment. You know, I've worked with narrative projects all over the country. You know, I'm in the deep south. I'm in, you know, parts of the northeast and, you know, parts of middle, middle America, Minnesota, and, you know, all these sort of middle parts of the country and also across the state of California and different, you know, projects where people are trying to lift up big ideas and trying to help make the, you know, make the case, right, for those big ideas. And I would say out of a lot of those projects, this is one of my favorites for many reasons. One, I'm going to just say this, one, because there really has been, I would say, a long-term commitment to this work across a group of organizations who understand the power of narrative. 
um, oftentimes when I work with groups, I'm like trying to convince them, I'm trying to help them to see the power of narrative and trying to like get them like, come on, come on, I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. And we usually get there, but it's been really nice over a longer period of time to have folks who really get that and have been at the table because they understand that. Um, and also folks who've been willing to put some sweat equity in. Like we've been, as Alina talked about, um, having a series of meetings and sessions right over the last I mean, 18 months or so, maybe even longer, but a series of folks who've been at the table, like, like working together, figuring it out, stumbling along, sharing with each other, being willing to ask some hard questions, being willing to be gently redirected, but also powerfully saying, hey, I'm, I don't care what the, sometimes, you know, the research might be saying one thing, but this is important to me as my value system, and so I want to stand on that truth too, and us trying to struggle with that. So I just, I feel like that kind of strong longevity of effort, um, I think is what you see reflected in the playbook and our work together. That is really powerful. Um, I'd also say that the work that we've been doing in this project is also really important, I would say, because I think the bellwether, the Bay Area is kind of the bellwether for what's about to happen to a lot of communities across the country. They're just getting started on a place where y'all have already been. Um, I work in a lot of places and they're just starting to be like, hey, like we really got, I mean, just on a whole range of issues about, you know, that, that, that I would say in the Bay Area is like front and center and for other areas, they're just waking up to this, like, you know, we have a serious problem here and we, you and I, average everyday folks, we got to step up because this is not going in the right direction. And without our mobilization around these issues, policymakers will not, let's, let's just call it, they won't end up in the right place. They won't make the decisions that are in line with what we need them to do. And so we have to stand up and push for what it means to have average everyday folks have a decent shot at success. Um, Y'all are already there. And so I feel like, you know, the, the decisions that you all make about how you shift the narrative in the Bay Area are going to have repercussions if you do it really well, but I feel like you are, um, are going to have repercussions for the rest of the country. So I've been telling, you know, Amy, I'm telling Lena, I'm like, you know, you know, stay focused on this effort because y'all are on to something that's not just important for the Bay Area, but I think important for the nation if you do this right. So, um, so all that to say, I want to just say a couple more things just about the work itself, just to ground it. And then I think I want to do this kind of a general walkthrough um, of the playbook, talking about what I see as really powerful and important, but I don't want people to miss as you go through the different pieces. And maybe even just talking a little about the structure of what it's meant to do. Uh, and also, quite frankly, what it's not meant to do. I, what I don't want you all to do is take that thing in and, and, and have it used, try to use it for something that it's not meant to do. So I feel like being very clear about what this is and what it's useful for, but also what it's not meant to do is gonna be really important. So, so at the top of this thing, I wanna say, just you know, really getting clear, this is a project about shifting the narrative, which means we're acknowledging that the narrative that exists is often around housing, is not often where we need it to be to advance what we call, what we would talk about as housing justice, not just you know, some better housing options, but really thinking about the way that housing and equity and the issues around that combine powerfully when we do this work well. Um, and the narrative, I would say, is challenging for us. It's not, it's not that people don't care about where they live. When we did some of the community voice sessions around this work, it was very clear. Housing was one of the number one things that people wanted to talk about. When you asked them what they wanted policymakers to solve, they didn't mince words, they, were, they didn't stutter, they weren't unclear, they were like, oh, I don't know. I mean, they were very clear. Solve this, this is a problem. We've been talking, right? So, so you know, the, the, the opportunity is there because people feel a kind of intensity that is in the Bay Area that you don't get, not just, not just you know, across the state of California, there are some communities that are not feeling it in the same way, but also across the country. So when we talk about what is, what is standing in the way then, if this is so important, why are people in the street literally on this issue? And I mean, I'm not talking about those of us who've been committed for a little while, right? Those of us who've been working. I'm talking about like average everyday folks are like, why are they not in the street saying what the hell is happening? And, I, and then maybe that's not always, right? The, the way that, 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 um, that change happens, but why don't we get people having a stronger sense of, uh, we right helping us to solve some of these issues, and I think one of the things that we recognize is that people are often stuck in a way of thinking about this issue that is just totally unproductive. What we might call dominant narratives, 
they're stuck in a frame about people as having individual responsibility and why can't they are stuck in a frame about housing as a commodity and you know housing equity and what they think they should get out of it or they're stuck in this us versus them homeowners versus renters those renters are having problems and not my problem whatever that is you know we need a way to unpack some of that conversation um, and mostly to get strategic about what we're looking at. I think if I were to ask anybody on this call, most of you were involved in housing, you'd be able to tell, say pretty quickly the kind of things you're hearing back from people when you say, yes, I know you care about housing. Will you come out to do this work with us? Will you come out to support? And then you get all kinds of different answers. I think you all could, could, could perfectly well identify those things. The thing that we're struggling with, though, is what should be our strategy vis-a-vis -vis some of those arguments, vis-a-vis -vis some of those issues, you know, and I hope that you'll find in the playbook that we attend to those issues very specifically. There are some of those narratives that are actually, when we unpack them, pretty helpful, right? Some of those narratives, if we just take them and kind of reframe them a little bit, can be very helpful to what we're trying to advance, but we got to reshape them a little bit. Some of those narratives are just so deeply ugly and, um, and, and othering and so deeply uh, dehumanizing that we're not going to even have that conversation. I, we, at, the end of, at the end of the playbook, we had you know, some of those barriers we just like pivot and avoid that we're not going to have a conversation about people's humanity. If that's where you are, <laughs> right, that, that's right, then stay, stay there because we're not, like, we're not going to have that conversation and our strategy is about pivoting and avoiding that. We're not dealing with that. Um, but there are places where people are deeply, they have misinformation and misconceptions, where we, we did some research to figure out if we pushed on those misconceptions a little bit, right? If we, if we gave people some different information and we watched them sort of unpack that, we could actually get them to come around to a better sensibility about some of these issues. And there's some of those narratives that you push on them a little bit, you can kind of get people to come out in a different place. It's just misinformation. And we could actually counter some of that stuff and actually make it better. Um, then there were some narratives that, that we've encountered, but also that some of the national research that uh, Alina was talking about uh, and some of the work that has been done locally by EMC, where we tested out some values to see, here's some values that we hear people talking about that, what's the strength of those values? If we amplify those values in our narratives, can we get people even more to lean forward? Um, and so you see in the playbook, you know, a way, way of thinking about what are the values that are already in play, right? but they need amplification, they need to be scaled, they need us to blast them out, they need the repetition of our time and our interests and our stories. Um, and then there are a whole set of things that are about attached you know, in other sectors, it, other narratives that are happening in other places in, in the racial justice movement and the health sector around COVID-19, some of the conversations around climate change, some of that stuff is actually pretty useful for us. Can we attach a housing message to that? and then have people who care about those issues as their central concerns, can we help them lean forward on housing in addition to the things that they already care about? So you'll see in this playbook, a really a careful attention to that strategy to sort of tease apart what we're looking at, right? So that we're very clear about it. And then to try to give some direction for how we might have some language to, to, to do the thing we're asking you to do, to amplify or to attach to reframe or to counter, to pivot and avoid, and just, right, <laughs> to, to say, listen, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that. We're not going there. Um, and so that's what I would say is my framing for the frame, framing for the the work itself. Um, I might also say just um, that one of the and Alina, you said this. I'm going to reify what you said before, which is the challenge and the opportunity of this effort is there are lots of folks in the Bay Area trying to have a conversation about this issue. Many of you are talking to different audiences. Many of you are lifting up different programs and investments or ballot measures or services or you know, all kinds of things. So, it, so this it didn't lend itself to like giving you the five words to say, right? Or you know, having a specific campaign where you would say, well, here is the campaign slogan, just say this over and over again. Um, it didn't lend itself to that kind of effort. It doesn't, it doesn't preclude it. We could certainly do that. But this effort was about kind of what, what is happening in terms of the narratives that already exist and how should we be thinking about those narratives initially. Um, so you'll see that we give you a lot of language, kind of sample language. It doesn't mean you need to pick up like that particular language and move it over to your, to your material, you know, but it means that this is the kind of language that you want to use that you might need to massage for the efforts that you have. 
Um, so again, it's not like to say that here's the three magic words to say. It is, here's a big challenge around narrative. We want to amplify this message. Here's some examples of where we've seen people try to amplify this message. Here are some narratives that we know we need to reframe. Um, and here's some examples of how we might begin to do that. So I just want to contextualize that to say that's the spirit in which this is given. Uh, it's not given in a way that says, so this is what this is not. It's not an effort to say, take this narrative, pick it up, and then like, this is the only thing you can ever say, or this is the way you say it. It is to say we're all, you know, that that's not the way that I think we want you to use it. It is to say this characterizes the context of messages that, that address this kind of issue. And if I tailor a little bit from what we're working with in our organization or on issues that we care about, we can still be in alignment with, right, the broader, right, um, uh, narrative development for folks across the field. And if we can all in our respective organizations start to get at least that, that kind of clarity around what we're after, what, what kind of messages we're trying to craft and create, then we get closer to being able to shift the conversation across the field. Okay, I've done a, 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 way, way too much on that part. I'm going to um, share my screen and actually just go through a little bit of the playbook itself. I won't go through all of it because I think um, you all have it in your hand, so you can go through it. I'll just go through and just point out, I think, some of the pages and parts of the playbook that I feel like are really important as you begin to think about the work and potentially um, uh, what might be most powerful as you try and begin to use it. So, all right. so, so we start this off just by introducing at a high level, I'm going to just flip through these slides, just talking about at a high level, like what is narrative to begin with? Um, and the reason I have to say, I love this, I, 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 Rashad, I probably should pay Rashad Robinson a fee at this point because I've been using some of this stuff so much in the work that I do. <laughs> in fact, I really, I probably, probably should. And, I, and the reason I say that is because he's really good about the idea of what narrative should be doing, right? It's not that, you know, a narrative is just the way that you tell a story. It's right, right in and of itself, that's really very simple. But, but what he tries to do is to be prescriptive. Like a narrative should open up people's sense of agency, should open up a sense that something can be done and give them a role. Like, like a, we need you to do something, right? And tell them like why it matters. And especially I would say in this moment where there's so much opportunity to kind of engage people differently. If, you're, if you look at your narrative and it's depressing the hell out of the people that you're talking to, then you probably got the wrong one, right? And I think Rashad Robinson is really good at talking about narratives as agency, narratives as, as building people's sense of power, right? Um, and I think, you know, for folks in the Bay Area, this notion of power is, is critical. Like, y'all get that, I think, like, like nobody's business, and that narrative and power are embedded with each other, and your narratives are pulling people forward into that. So I won't belabor the point. I just want to say that that's the spirit of which we were talking about narrative shift as a part of this process. So we do a little bit of intro into this, just getting people clear, you know, not just about the three Ps across the area, but really talking about this notion of housing justice and what that means in the context of the work at the Bay, and then giving kind of a five key points of what we're trying to do with this work so that people really understand why it's so important. Um, and again, my assumption is that y'all, y'all have this right in your hand, so I'm not, <laughs> so I'm not stopping to go through with these pages, I'm just making sure that we go through. Um, to my point earlier, when I was talking about this work, I said that, you know, part of this effort is to tease apart what we're seeing and to get strategic about what we're looking at. And so what you see here are the sort of elements of, of, of messaging that as we did this work, really, it can be pulled out of the research for helping people think about what our messages should embody. So I'm going to go through a few of these just to help us, but it's all about being strategic about what we're looking at and then how we respond. So so a couple of these, you know, I'll go through a few that I think are particularly important. This is probably for me, I think, hopefully one of the one of the simplest and one of the most important and also one of the ones that y'all should, you know, no matter what you do, like this is, <laughs> this is, this is crit critically important, especially at this time, which is just aim the power of the moment. And I would say, don't underestimate the fact or don't, you know, that, that not, or don't assume that all Bay Area folks kind of really get the power that we're seeing in this moment to create change. This is a really moment to sort of go big or go home. This is, this is we haven't seen the scale, I would say, of the housing crisis at this level in years. And we also haven't seen 
the opportunity, I would say, really to have a more coordinated response in housing, probably in the last 30 years, as far as I'm concerned, not only in the Bay Area, but across the country. This is a really important moment to not just be sort of saying, well, how do we get some more units over here, this part of the Bay, or a couple, a couple units there? This is like, no, no. This is about the fact that we have made a, 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 a housing system that does not produce equity, that is patently in and of itself, sort of baked and steeped in sort of structural racism that is not sustainable over the, right? It's not sustainable, right? If you look at the way we've structured the damn thing, it, it, it won't last, it doesn't, right? Over the long term, we know that, like lots of our systems, they don't have longevity because we haven't built that into the way they're structured um, and they don't produce equity. So this is the moment to take the damn thing off the assembly line and to remake it. And so don't, you know, I know sometimes we're often afraid to, to, to talk big like that because it scares some people. They think, oh my God, these are folks are trying to recreate the whole damn thing. But this is the moment where there's an opportunity to go big, like where you can say, Listen, folks, at the scale of which we're talking about, you can't solve this with little small tinkering around at the edges. So name the moment that we're in. I, I always call this the adaptive challenge. I know that people often say, well, you know, it gets hard for the nomenclature of the people to be thinking about it that way. But there are lots of big adaptive challenges. Um, so in the, in the actual text for each one of these, you know, we talk a little bit about like why this matters, what it's supposed to do when you name the moment. What is this, this adaptive challenge and what do you mean when you say that? And why do you need to position that kind of early on in the message? Um, mostly I would say because you, not only do you want to be bold and you want to get people the urgency of the moment, but it helps people to sort of get clear about the, the importance of this in this moment. Like we have COVID-19 happening, the economic fallout of that, the challenges that are going to happen because of the sort of tech automation and what that's going to you know, happen in terms of our economy. We've got wildfires going. Like we got some stuff, people, and our systems need to be ready and prepared to deal with that. We won't be able to move the Bay into the future if we don't address this stuff, all of it, right? Um, and I also say that this is the moment to position that as the villain. And I, I know this is all, we'll, we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll have some conversation in the chat about this, and I'm sure we'll come back to it because people always ask this question, you know, for the work, especially in the work that we're talking about here, but Housing is one of those things that requires so many stakeholders to come around the table and kind of align themselves. And it gets really hard to start naming people. Everybody's got a bill in their name, and right? the folks who don't want to have housing, they're naming the villain as you liberal socialist, blah, 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 and the other folks. Listen, we don't have time to be in the blame game, but who the hell is to blame? The issue is that we are battling the race of time, right? And how we have systems that are prepared to, that, to, to address the scale of the crises. And these crises that we're taking off, they're not, they're not going to stop because we have so many, we have so many issues that we've kicked down the can down the road so many times it's at a certain point, like at a certain point, the climate, like you're going to, like you, you are destroying the planet. At a certain point, the planet says, okay, enough, right? But we know what that timetable looks like. The same thing with housing. At a certain point, you, you, you can't keep kicking the can down the road about solving housing. At a certain point, you can't kick the can down the road of like not having a health system that's able to address issues of viruses. You just, right, so you, we don't have time to play the blame game. What we are focused on is how do we adapt these systems so that they are able to address the equity outcomes that we, we, that we need, so that the process is inclusive, so that we address issues of racism, and so these systems are sustainable. When that becomes the focus and the urgency of the moment, right, people are able to lean in because they hear you talking specifically about what is needed in this moment. So in addition to these Why This Matters pages, for each of these, we also give some sample language. Again, this is not meant for you to take off the shelf and like put it in your, it, it's fine if you do, you can tailor some of this, but it's meant to give the spirit of this recommendation. Like start by talking about like, hey folks, the world is changing around us. <laughs> like in this, how we are responding in this moment, it matters, right? We can't keep kicking the can down the road or pretending as if some of these issues don't require immediate action. Um, and so your ability to kick that off really matters. So I'm not going to spend as much time on each one of these as I did on these. So I want to make sure we have lots of time for discussion. But I do at least want to tick through some of the major recommendations across the sort of strategy that we've come up with. So amplify. We know there are a set of messages that are, are, that are already in play that we can amplify. And here, this is the place for values. 
there's been so much good values testing around housing and housing justice that there's an opportunity to really lean into those values um, really, really hard because we know we've tested these things out that they work. So don't miss the opportunity to let these values do some heavy lifting, right? They've been tested for a reason. And so in the Why This Matter session, uh, section, we talk about the, the folks who've been testing this out. So EMC Research, our good colleagues at EMC, um, always testing out good, you know, polling data and survey data across the Bay Area. Um, when we did this work with them, um, you know, we, we got a chance to see what are the values that show up most powerfully. Uh, and this one about the legacy that we owe our children came up pretty powerfully. And actually, I should say that also came up with the Lake Research. The, uh, Lake Research, the, the Funders for Housing and Opportunity also did some research with the Lake and, and, and not Osario Shaker and uh, Race Forward and Policy Link, a bunch of folks, right? Who were thinking specifically about the race class narrative and how you embed that in housing. That was also one of the values that showed up there. So we'll actually make sure that gets in there. But this legacy that we owe our children is a consistent winner. When people get that value system, they start thinking about the fact that their own children can't afford to live in the Bay and they're mad about that. And man, what, does that mean I have to move because my children are moving away? And so that value system, lifting that up, makes people start to grapple with what's needed because they feel some dissonance around that. And so it helps us to make our case. And so there's several here. People talked about, you know, the aspirational place where our dream, where people are free to pr pursue their dreams. EMC did some value testing on that, which came out, came back really well. The Lake Research I was talking about, the National Research came back with a lot of good content about people first. As we, as we lift up people, people have to come first, right? Before we start to, you know, um, invest in, you know, all these other things, if we're not fueling the thing that's actually supporting our communities, then we're going to miss out on the opportunity to do so anyway. Um, so a huge thing around health and well-being is always a winner. <laughs> when you talk about just our homes are the foundations of our health, without that, it's hard to do any of this other stuff, even, to even consider thriving. When you lift up that value, people lean in pretty hard. And then other things, so interdependence, we're all into interdependent. You may think that it's all about you and your own individual home that you have, but that home sits in the middle of a community, which sits in the middle of a, of a city, which sits in the middle of a region. All of those things and the decisions that are made at those levels are interdependent. So you are not separate. In fact, across the region, what happens across the region matters for everybody in that region. So we give some examples of that kind of language um, um, in, the, in the playbook and also talk a little about the fairness across places that in some parts of the Bay, you've got all these great resources, others not, that ain't fair, right? And for, and for whatever reason, there is a people lean into that conversation. Um, and so there's a, way to, there's a way to talk about that with, some, with, with great clarity. And so again, there's some it's a sample language, right? You don't have to lift every single word out of this, but beginning to embody the spirit of that, reinforcing those values early on in your message helps to pull people forward. So amplify that when you talk about the work. Reframing. So here's a good one. So reframing, we found in, the, in part of the, a lot of this work, uh, there are a lot of places where the conversation about loss was really important. People who know me, they know I talk about this a lot. The sort of loss framing and loss aversion is huge. Um, and I will say there, there are two things that, that, I, that, I, that, that you need in a message. You need a gain frame and you need a loss frame. The gain frame is your value statement. That tells people what they get when they work with us. What you get is a Bay Area that's affordable for you and for your children to live here. What you get is health and well-being. What you get is that we're putting people first. What you get is a region that's stronger. That's a gain frame. But what I will tell you, if you're also not queuing up and telling people what they lose, right, the, that, that, that doesn't have the power of a full message, right? Um, game frame is strong, but it's not strong enough to pull people forward. If you don't know what people are afraid to lose and you're not communicating that in the context of a message, you do not have what you need to pull them forward, right? It's that my grandmother used to say, you know, the, the old colloquium is a bird in a hand is worth two in a bush, right? You could tell somebody, if you lean with, in with us, you get those two birds over there, you get a healthier region, you get this and that, but people will continue to hold on to the bird in hand because they're afraid to lose. If I let this thing go and I don't get that, I'm, I'm afraid that there's loss. Loss aversion is the single dominating force in human decision-making. It is the basis of almost all behavioral economics, right? In terms of how we think about those work that work. And so it is important. 
in the, in the affordable housing space, when people think about affordable housing, they often are thinking about if I support this, what am I going to lose? If these folks move into my community and you know who these folks are, I'm going to lose the property values in my neighborhood. I'm going to lose that, that uh, view of the whatever the park that I love because they're going to try to build buildings that are high and have more density and I'm going to lose my view. I'm gonna, it's going to create more traffic. And so I'm going to be, I don't know. and so they're ticking off in their heads all the things that they lose. And so you and I have to get lost back on the other side of that table, which is no, what you should be concerned is about is what you're going to lose if you don't work with us and help us to figure this out. You're going to lose everything you love about the Bay Area because you're not leaning into what we need to plan for our future, right? Get people more concerned about what they lose if they're not leaning in to figure this thing out versus what they think they lose on the other side. So in a complete message, you want to give them that game frame. And game frame always comes first. Always, 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 always comes first. But then tell me what I lose if I don't, if I don't work with you, if I don't lean in, if I don't do anything, if I don't show up to your meetings, if I don't show up in a way that is powerful, you know, if I don't have the courage at this moment to stand up, like what does that mean? Right? If nothing happens, if nothing happens, I'm sitting at home on my couch, right? <laughs> so so tell me what happens that that requires me to stand up and do that. And so you'll see very specific information there about what you lose, how we should position that, um, and then some discussion there about what people lose. I would love to come back to this conversation because I would say one of the things that surprised me most when we did the community voice sessions on this was what Bay Area what people, residents, right, talked about they were afraid to lose. It was different than any place I've heard in the country. I think, you know, probably think Amy and Alina probably heard me talking about this the most, where I was like, what in the hell is happening? I, when we were doing some of these sessions, I would come out of sessions like, what? <laughs> like, anywho, um, and, it, and it's different. So, I, so you know, what I would say is maybe we can have a conversation if folks are interested in what people talked about they were most afraid to lose in the conversation. But that loss frame, reframing the loss as what you lose if you're not working with us is really important. Um, so this one should be easy for folks, center equity. I don't care what conversation you're having. I don't care who you're having. I don't care if you're talking to somebody who doesn't care about equity. This is for me, and I hope you all agree, this is about unseating some dominant narratives that are challenging, but we, ha we just have to do the work. This is, you know, and I know this is, you know, we, we have gone back and forth on a couple of these conversations around this issue on equity and how you talk about it. My attitude about this is always to make sure we're having a very strong conversation about equity as strong as you could possibly get it. I think this moment lifts up the opportunity to have that conversation. Um, and what I would say to you all is, don't miss the opportunity to have that conversation. And also, don't assume that people are ready to support equitable housing policy simply because they have a conversation about the growing economic divide or the racial divide. People, when we did the community voice sessions, people were very willing to have that conversation, but then we got to like, what do you want to do about it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, so, so this conversation is really important. Um, you see in the playbook some pretty important language about lifting up exclusionary, the history of exclusionary policies and structural racism. Having people acknowledge where that is that is very important, especially for people of color. It's like if we if we're having a conversation and you're not going to acknowledge what has happened in the past, it's hard to move forward, right? And so I would say, in order to keep your base right, moving forward, that acknowledgement is important, and it's important to position that. Um, you don't want to linger there throughout the whole conversation because it is challenging. Some of the national research that, you know, the Funders for Housing Opportunity did said, listen, this conversation about history and exclusionary policies didn't get very far, um, and that may be true, but you got to have that acknowledgement. Otherwise, folks who would normally who would want to lean in don't feel like this is a real thoughtful effort around these issues. So there's some language about centering equity and about systems change. And so I hope that you will take the time to, to, to talk about that. And some of that is built into this sort of loss framing. Like if you don't do this, you're going to leave behind whole neighborhoods that require blah, 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 blah. And you'll see that reflected. But anyway, um, so attach. Um, there are a lot of narratives that are happening outside of housing that are particularly productive, especially in the health space, racial justice. And this was just a nod to say, acknowledge what those narratives are. Some of them are actually pretty helpful when we were in the community voice sessions. And I think at some of the EMC work research that we did specifically in the Bay Area, 
you could see people be willing to kind of like like some of those narratives were some of the strongest narratives that got people to support housing policy. So you know those narratives on health and well-being, some of the strongest right policy the framing that got people moving forward. Um, but this is also important because it allows us to bring other sectors in as partners in a thoughtful way. And we need other partners, right? How we can't be just be housers talking to other housers. We got to be housers talking about and speaking to a range of folks. And this gives us the opportunity to connect in a very powerful way. So there's some discussion about why that matters, as we talked about, and then some sample language. So mobilize. This is about being willing to go beyond the usual suspects. We already have a lot of folks on the same page. And I know this is hard because some folks are like, let's just get the base riled up. We're going to move the base. Yes, that is true. But if you don't, if we don't bring some other people to the table, right, we don't have the power that we need to have transformative policies happen. You can't, you can't, un, you can't unseat, I would say, structural racism with only a small percentage. I mean, you to do that kind of work, you need some more. Even at, at very least, you need some more folks who are at least not going to oppose you as much as they would if you were right coming out with a with a different kind of message. So this is a nod to say that we have to be talking to folks who are outside of the, the, the folks who are already embedded in. And so um, reaching beyond our usual suspect is important. And so there's some language about how we begin to have a, more, a bigger, a bigger co a coalition around this stuff. And a part of it is, which is, may, this may be counterintuitive, is to put housing back in the driver's seat of some of these issues. I can talk about that in the break if people get confused about that, but this mobilization is about bringing some of these other folks in especially on issues for renters where, you know, homeowners might say, ah, that's not so much. So there's some discussion and some sample language there. Um, so the last two, counter. So there are narratives that we, they're just misinformation. And so just countering the logic of some of that misinformation, we tried to represent some of those things here, but you all probably also know some of those things. And you will know, you know, you start to figure out what are the narratives that can easily be countered when you push on them a little bit and people go, okay, you know, they, those are not the dominant. The dominant narratives, when you push on them a little bit, they push people in the opposite direction and then they go off with passionate stuff about why you are wrong, right? That just sends people in the, you go down a rabbit hole when you get to a dominant narrative and you know when you hit one of those things. And it's not that you can't unseat the, those dominant narratives. It just means that it takes a longer period of time. You need, we need a cultural shift of, of counter messages over time to get to those. But there are some of those that are just misinformation that can be countered. And so we try to give some of those right here. Um, I even talked about one of those kind of messages in the Housing California conference um, last week, the unconference, where I talked about the sort of politics of lucky. People, especially in the Bay Area, man, was that a popular conversation. People always talked about being lucky. Like I'm, I was I was lucky that I bought in the Bay, I bought my home in the Bay Area when you could still afford to or I was lucky that I had a friend who owned a house and they would rent to me for cheaper. I was lucky. And there was all this conversation about lucky. And I'm like, who the hell cares about luck? I'm trying to figure out how do we make sure that if everybody in the Bay Area has a decent place to live. Like you shouldn't have to be lucky to have that happen. Um, and so you can talk about that, counter that conversation. Like people, but actually it's great that you were lucky. That's really wonderful. But luck really shouldn't have anything to do with whether or not your kids have a decent place to sleep at night. That's what we're about, and that's what, right. So let's talk about what it means to move away from lucky, and what it means to move into systems development, and let's talk about what's keeping us from getting there. That's a conversation that you can, and, and people are willing to hear that. Yeah, that's that's true. You know that I was lucky, but you shouldn't have to be. And so they, that's something you can push on and get people to kind of back up, um, and so do so. And we give some language about how you can help to just some about how you get there. And the last one was, so our good old friends, these really strong dominant narratives. Um, the stuff that is just hard because people, we, they're deeply embedded kind of stuff that we've been consuming our whole lives because we live in this culture. You know, the notion that home ownership is all, is the only way to be, have stability in a community and you have to be a homeowner and it has to look like a single family home is what is at the top of the hierarchy. And if you don't have that with, you know, two-car garage, you know, a dog, a cat, white picket fence, like that kind of, oh boy, that American, the American dream kind of stuff, you know, like, yeah, you know, like, you know, and some of the stuff about people, individual responsibility, yada, yada, oh boy, you know, 
it just trips us up. And it's not that, again, it's not that we can't unseat that kind of stuff. It just takes a lot more to do that than most of us have time for. If you're like me, you're thinking about the fact that we have stuff to do now. Like I, I you know, I think, you know, I have my own family. I have folks who are struggling with COVID-19. I have no time to go around talking about whether people should be in charge of their own health care. I just need to get my family some support today. I don't have time to be waiting around to you figure out, come to your senses that, you know, everybody deserves dignity. Like I, we're not going there. So, so there are a set of narratives that are just, it's not they cannot be overcome, but in the short term, we're trying to get stuff done. Some of that might be better or more usefully addressed by pivoting around some of that stuff. And so I give some advice and counsel here about how to do a successful pivot. You can say, you know what, as long as it's not about, you know, my humanity, it might, if it's some of these other things, you know, you know, I share your concern about the community, but that's why I believe that our health and well-being is best addressed if we really lean into this issue of affordable housing. Because when we do that, X, Y, Z happens for, you know what, you put a number of issues on the table, you can even put it in writing, there are a number of issues that folks have laid out about this issue, but it really all comes back to at the end of the day, are we putting people first? If we're doing that, and that's our central operating mo modality, then you have to look at what's happening in housing and say, we can do better, right? That's the kind of language and that's the kind of pivot that you want. What you don't want to do is lean into this foolishness about um, drugs and mental health and homeless. It was just, there was such a, just a strong sense of um, that those conversations, none of those conversations are not important. They are, but they send people down this rabbit hole that was just, oh, not terribly helpful. So I'm sure there will be questions about this, about how we do that, when we know to do that, um, uh, some discussion about that, but we just wanted to make sure that people were clear about what some of those things are that we found. We talked to folks today about some of these issues that just were just tough. Like it just, our attempts to sort of pull them out of that stuff, it's not impossible, but takes a long time. So um, there are a couple of different templates in the guide that are trying to speak to to help you begin to speak to different audiences. We know that we've got at least three. This may, we may even have more than that. In fact, some of the CZI research, um, uh, the, the Chan Zuckerberg um, uh, uh, initiative has been working on some research that might help us even to break this up a little bit to kind of expand our notion of these three groups, these traditional three groups, by thinking about you know, how we might segment our office, our, our, our audience into some even finer you know, gradations. Um, for now, the three that people tend to think about when we think about our audience is we got folks who are already in support of affordable housing. They're already there. There's a way in which we can line up that message along these ends. Then there are folks who are by, what I call bystanders. Um, I know some folks call them persuadables, right? Persuadable, but I call them bystanders. They just, they, you know, they're not getting, they may even see something's wrong with what's happening, but they're not, they're not getting involved. They're not leaning in in the way we need them to. And so they need a stronger message and they need some additional things. And you can see the architecture, like naming the power of the moment, either using one of those framing, that, attaching and or reframing, centering equity, countering some of the misinformation that's keeping them from leaning in and then mobilizing and asking for a call to action. And then there are good friends of contrarians, the ones who, no matter what you say, they don't really care. They just, they're not, they're, they're, they're never gonna come through but those of us who are in a position where you have you have to talk to those contrarians because they're standing in the way between you and systems change. There may be some legislators in this camp. There may be some, you know, you do your best with them. Name the moment. Try to reframe the conversation in terms of what they lose if they don't support what we're trying to do. Center the conversation about equity. Do not miss the opportunity, even amongst our contrarians, to center equity. And then pivot and avoid. Get away from the stuff that is just, you know, listen, we're, like, we're not talking that conversation. And the call to action for them is also a little bit different too. For them, we're not really asking them to get involved because they're contrary to our stuff. So we don't really want them involved. We kind of want them to get out of the way. But what we can do is to have them do things like, you know, volunteer with organizations that want to, you know, preserve how they'll do that. Like these are the folks who, they may not be affirmative on affordable housing, but they'll go and volunteer with like Habitat for Humanity. You know what, if that's what you can do, do that, right? great, go and do that. Or they may be willing to put, you know, aside some resources to invest in, you know, how different houses. So, okay, do that. But do, your, your call to action is not necessarily to get them to come out stronger in terms of advocacy because they're not, 
they're not quite ready to embrace the, you know, an agenda that is about housing justice. So we want to pivot and avoid and then help them to do some volunteer activities that might help families who, you know, the stuff that they're willing to do that can actually be helpful. Um, and so finally, um, there's some examples. So we try to take a couple examples of like how you would do that for different groups. So this first one is about, this is our base. Here's a basic template. Now, again, this is not just all the, this is the language that I might use for some of these folks. You might have even stronger language. You might take some things out. This is just to give you the kind of narrative arc or the architecture of how you might iterate the message, but take license to kind of shape it in terms of the things that you know would be important to you. If you want to amplify and you want to use this notion about strong communities for all and our children in the Bay Area, give that some life and amplify that in a way that feels most relevant to you. But the idea is for our base, like amplify the stuff that is that works to pull them forward, right? So it's just trying to give you the architecture of what you might do. It's not meant to be walk out the door language, right? Same thing with our new champions, a little bit of a different approach. We might attach some other kinds of messaging. We might have a, a little bit of a softer pitch on equity, but one that is still important. We might counter some stuff that they're believing that is not true to kind of pull them forward. But the idea is to, to, to have a message that was in the within the context of, of what will help those bystanders and persuadables to come forward. And then our good old contrarians, you know, we, we, you know, we want to give them the moment, maybe attach a message, give them a little bit of equity, probably the lightest touch we can, right, just to, <laughs> and I would say for them, even more that loss, that, that loss framing, like nobody wins if people, you know, leave our city, nobody wins if people, like, hello, you know, right, that kind of, kind of loss aversion stuff, pivot and avoid, um, and then the call to action, go talk to Habitat. And, and by the way, I'm sure there might be some Habitat folks on the phone. This is not, to, this is not at all to demean what Habitat or anybody else does. It just means that that appeals to a particular group of folks who may or may not always be um, uh, from out of the gate, very interested in um, a, a stronger affordable housing policies and system change. That's all. So just pay, I'm making sure. I know some of my Habitat, Habitat for Humanity colleagues may be on the call. Um, and they may even quibble with me a little bit, but I'm just saying, right? All right, so um, finally, there's a couple kind of longer pieces, some potential op-eds, just to give some examples of, again, one for a base, you know, one for some persuadables, one that might do well with persuadables and contrarians, just to give a little bit more language. By the way, the data in here is not real data, just kind of general language. So if you are going out with this, make sure you change that data. Um, just to give a sense of how you would, this one in particular, message three was about how you might start with affirmative framing with your data rather than negative framing, because so many of us start this conversation around affordable housing with negative data. So this is the example of like how you would not start there. How would you start with data that's actually like what the investment look like and what do we get or gain um, and, and, and do that. Um, so it's not my intention to tell you all who is your base or who are the persuadables. I'm, my, my assumption is you all in your advocacy efforts are, are working on these issues and you know a little bit about those folks given kind of who you're normally in front of. But that is a conversation that comes up when we may have some conversation about that in chat. I'm happy to, I'm happy to have some of my colleagues who, who live and work and breathe in the Bay Area to, to, to lift that up, that conversation up if people have questions there. So lots of things to come. Um, next, and I think, you know, the rest of this is some description about what we actually did in the research, like what we actually, the, the arc of the entire journey, the narrative shift, and a nod to some of our partners. Thank you so much for everybody who's been involved in this. Um, and I want to say, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, because that's kind of the end of our, our session. Um, certainly, we need collaborators. And I would say, um, you know, I, I want to go back to where we started this conversation and really reinforce um, kind of Ryan at the beginning of the call. Um, <laughs> which is that, you know, narrative is not just about our, again, it's not about just our press releases. Narrative is not just about, you know, the formality of our advocacy efforts and our fact sheets and our, you know, whatever that is. It's about how we're embodying the spirit of, the, of what we want to see and pushing that forward. And so what my narratives look like on this may end up being slightly different. But what this presentation is about is are there elements of those narratives that we can all be using together and in tandem that help us have a much more powerful, not just conversation, but that becomes repetitive enough, that people hear it enough in enough places 
where it starts to be kind of the way that Bay Area folks think about the world, right? Um, and then that helps us over time to, be, to, to not have to fight so hard for basic things that are about basic human dignity, right, for folks across the region. So I'm going to stop there. That was a lot in a, in a little bit of span of time, but hopefully you've got plenty of time for Q&A, to ask questions, um, uh, and to talk about next steps if folks are interested. Thank you so much, Dr. T. Yes, there was robust chats happening during the presentation and folks have started to put some of their questions into the chat box. And um, I'm just gonna encourage everyone here um, from the conversations you're having in the chat box as that's crystallizing specific questions you wanna to get into, please do put that in the QA box. That'll be the easiest, best way to make sure that I can share those questions with Dr. T and get her feedback and perspective. Um, and as I, as we said earlier, don't, don't be shy, uh, bring, bring what you ask about what you think is a challenge or a difficulty or a hardship in moving this forward, because we're, we're here to figure it out together. And if you have thoughts or ideas, um, that you want us to be thinking about, that could be another good thing to bring forward to that QA box. Um, and I'm just going to start with one that happened early on Dr. T. Um, a couple folks were chatting about this in the chat box. Um, this is around naming adaptive challenges and being careful not to get so specific on individuals as villains. Um, and I'll just read the question as it's written. If we choose not to name the actors who produce and replicate these systems, how do we talk about systems without falling into the trap of thinking about the economy or the housing market as agency less and inevitable forces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so great question. I knew that was going to be one of the first ones, right, because it always is, because there is this, I think there is this conversation among a lot of folks that you got to like name the person that, that you know, or group of persons who are to blame for the mess that we have are, you know, in front of us. And, and I think that inclination is right. What's, what's challenging for us is that what often happens is we end up being in a blame game. And that is the thing that gets us stuck. Like, I don't care. Like, you know, I mean, I think about, I'm going to say from my own perspective, you know, do I like Donald Trump? Absolutely not. Do I need to get him out? Yeah. But, but Donald Trump is really not what I'm after. Because even if you move him out of the way and you put somebody else in who doesn't have a perspective on social structural racism, we're going to be back in the same situation anyway. What I want to say is the system that I need that helps me and my family um, to, to have longevity of life, to have to be thriving in community is somebody who understands what it means for everybody to have housing, what it means for folks to be able to show up at a doctor's office and be cared for, what it means to show up at the doors of a school and be and, ha and have quality education. So, so all of that recommendation is not to say the economy is the problem, but we need our systems to operate better. We need them to embody e equity. We need them to embody inclusiveness. We need to be thoughtful on issues of race, making sure that we are not recreating the mistakes of the past. Um, in terms of how we design these systems, and we need them to be sustainable. That's what I'm and right. And you can say right now, today, we are not prepared for the future that's coming. We are not. Not only are we not handling the current crisis very well, we are not prepared for the future that is coming. And my inclination is that that's our villain, right? It's our ability to adapt to a world that's changing. And I will say to you know what I said in the conversation before. We're going to have a series of crises. This is not the like coronavirus is the is at the top of the leaderboard today. But you can think about in every sector, in every part of the work, there is a crisis looming because we have not. And when I say we, I can certainly name some folks, but I will say because we have not, we've been kicking the can down the road for so long that now every damn thing is in crisis. You don't want to put that in front of folks as it's the crisis. You're saying, listen, I'm forward thinking. We need to get prepared for all the things that are coming. And one of the things that allows us to be prepared is addressing housing. So we, let's, let's get to work, right? I don't care who's in office. I don't care what, right? right. And well, I, I have a lot more to say about that, but I, I know that's just the first question. So let's, let's let that be the warm up. <laughs> I, I wanna actually do a follow up on that if you don't mind, um, because I, I think all of this is so important. And especially when it comes to like, someone like Donald Trump, to your point, like that there's, there's a reason he got elected. It's not just him as one individual. And if once we get him out, everything gets fixed. And he's also 
so good at seizing the conversation around away from what we want to be talking about. And so, you know, like he's tweeting a thing and we're like, Oh my God, he tweeted the thing. And we lose sight of the actual policies that are happening. Right. Um, so I I'm just thinking about ways to sort of like reconcile that with giving people a way to name people caused solutions so that we can offer people created solutions. Can you just say a little more about how those two pieces of advice work together? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I'll just, and I, and I will just say, just to even lean into the, to the example that you gave, you're absolutely right. Donald Trump is, a, is, is, is very skilled at that, right? With that sort of, the, the art of distraction, <laughs> right? And the art of slow braining folks where he will just say something that's so outrageous and you just can't believe it. And then you tell all your friends like, can you believe what he said? Can you believe what he said? And what happens is then he becomes the center of the conversation and we've lost sight of the fact that before Donald Trump even came into office, we had in every city and state across this country, we had a housing system that undermined the success of people of color. Period. Before he even, right? So that, so, but now the conversation about this guy who was orange hair, which is really irrelevant. So all I'm saying is, let's not be, let's not have that be the distraction. It doesn't mean that we ignore that. It means, for example, when Donald Trump, he's been Trump, he's tweeting about suburban moms, right? He's figured out that from an election standpoint, he needs to win suburban moms, right? Then, right, to try and win. So that's the strategy of calling them forward in the conversation. Um, but our conversation would be, you know what? I'm not going to talk about that, but you know what? Since we are having this, since you called out suburban moms, right, and what's happening in suburban communities, let's have that conversation. Here's what's wrong with policies and how we're th thinking about urban areas versus, right, the suburbs and, and the fact that we haven't had regional systems or regional strategies around housing that really capture the way that systems need to work best. So let's fix that. And then, and then he doesn't become the purpose of that conversation. The, the fixing what is wrong remains centered. And the same thing with folks who might call out. You can say greedy developers, or greedy developers. then they become the subject of a con the conversation. Yeah, they were, but what I'm more concerned about is the way they've been able to lobby through their efforts to get preferential treatment around development opportunities. And the rest of us have had to deal with that. So all that to say, the recommendation here is keep the conversation focused where it belongs which is redesigning systems that are not broken, they're not broken, but systems that are producing outcomes that are not helpful, that are undermining our communities and have been for a very long time. And if we do that, we'll get much more support for the thing that we really care about, which is making sure those systems are reformed. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna read you a question now, um, an, an anonymous question. Um, I think that's really getting to the root of our initiative's goals to really be uh, race forward and explicit about the role of racial justice and housing justice, and yet doing this in a way that's um, really helpful and not harmful uh, to our goals. And so the question here says, um, I'm being told we should focus on policies that would entice middle, upper, middle class um, BIPOC families to move into Marin rather than encouraging more affordable housing and advocating for renters' rights. Why? Being told that affordable housing answer reinforces stereotypes of um, BIPOC people all being poor and that the renters' rights narrative is not right because we need to be giving people home ownership possibilities to build wealth rather than keeping them in the perpetual renter trap. So actually, I'm going to say this is a little bit about sort of the race forward questions, and it's also about that homeowner versus renter tension, assuming one is better than the other. Can you comment on that? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> There's a lot going on here. And I will say that, you know, that, 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 was a, that was an important part of this work. I mean, not just in the sort of, you know, the qualitative work that we conducted, but I think in the work that EMC did around this work to try and figure out that piece of it. Because it is a challenge when you have, you know, a region that has so many renters, I think, right? You all are literally like renter, like the, the highest percentage of renters in a lot of areas, or say for like New York or LA or some places like that. So this conversation is particularly ripe and ready. And a part of it was, how do we get a different conversation? Can we, can one, can we undermine some of the dominant narratives that are, that are challenging our ability to have people understand their shared stake in this issue? 
renters are on the damn it. I mean, homeowners are in the same damn boat really as renters in terms of all of us are being undermined by a housing system that's not terribly helpful. But we don't often see it that way, right? It's that kind of us versus them, which is not helpful. And so one part of it was to think about that. And then the other piece of it was then are there things that help us mobilize renters as a constituency for this effort? Um, and I would say there was a lot of strong advice and counsel um, that came out of those. Some of the some of it got sort of fully baked in. Some, not all of it got but got fully baked in the playbook. Uh, on, but I would say on the on the first part of that, you know, the 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 goal that you're trying to address should not waver. Your goal is is not to is not just to create an environment where uh, middle class families can live. Your goal is to make sure that we have the right mix of housing types. For a variety of different people who need to be housed in the community. Keep that focused and right. That that that's the goal. There's a diversity of what we need, and and that we ought to be thinking about how we provide that in a way that is fair for for all folks who need to and want to be here. Um, the the challenge is how do you get people to see their stake in it? So how do you get homeowners, for example, to see their stake in this conversation about renters? Um, and there was a lot that came, especially out of the community voice sessions. I, I will say, let me just give an example. One of the things that helped, you know, let me step back, because this was, this was actually really good. So it, it was really interesting. We did the community voice sessions. We did some of them that were with mix of homeowners and renters. And then we did some that were just with renters. Alina, you remember this, these separate conversations where we got renters together. I mean, they, they, they sort of knocked it down. I mean, they were on point right away. We put those renters back into the, or in the, had renters in the conversation with homeowners, their voices got lost. And it was because of this issue around homeowners having the sort of right of, right, the right to have, be the community voice in the context of renters. And when we asked about this conversation about, you know, renters having, you know, rights and have, you know, the homeowners actually laughed. I mean, like there was like derision, like, <laughs> let me tell you, if you try to kick a renter out of your place, let me tell you, the, the government will do, and they laughed. It was like funny to them that that, that was even a proposition. Um, but I will also say, so we obviously had to get through that, but I would also say one of the things that put them in the same space was when we had homeowners start talking about um, their own challenges with keeping their own homes up, right? When they start talking about, man, I, I, I was told that I should own my own home and I bought this house but the house is older. You know, a lot of the housing stock in the Bay Area is older. And so we'll start talking about, man, just all the repairs that I have to do on this house. It's tough, man. And nobody's helping me. And they started to talk about that when they had that conversation. And then we talked about issues of, that renters were having. They were much more um, ready to have that conversation because they all, they all of a sudden felt in a very vulnerable position and they connected to the vulnerability of, of renters. Um, so I would say we would we have to sort of test that out a little bit more. I would say I would want some great, some additional help from, from polling or EMC and some other partners to kind of really work that out. But it was clear that there were some conditions under which some of those folks who were homeowners started to have a different conversation. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is just, I, I think, you know, don't, we, we have to begin to undermine this conversation about the American dream and that that looks like home ownership and that's the only thing. And so if you're being told that, you know, renters' rights don't matter, you're only talking to middle class folks, right, then that's a reason to lean into this playbook, that you're giving people who might not otherwise come to this conversation a reason to lean into this conversation about renters. So all that conversation in the attached category, right, or in the reframing conversation, tell them what they lose, right, if they don't have, if they don't make sure that renters in their community actually have stability too. And also attach these other conversations that are happening in other sectors that allow you to bring in some of these powerful voices from other places. Anyway, lots of things to say about that, but I think you nailed that conversation that there is this kind of renters versus homeowners, us versus them, which is not terribly helpful and it's causing a lot of challenges in our ability to advocate effectively around these issues. Yeah, yeah. That was a lot to unpack. I am impressed. <laughs> Big questions here from the group. Um, Here's um, sort of a more practical uh, request for advice um, from Carol, who says, when I'm just having introductory conversations, I try to avoid the word policy because it makes people nervous or glassy eyed. So what advice can you offer about how to talk about policy making and the impacts of that when you're talking to people who are really new to civil activism and might, 
you know, be afraid of that word. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would say that the, your first inclination is not to is not to try and have people, especially folks who are new to the conversation, not to talk about policy. Put in front of them the vision of the future that that they want, right? So, what's the thing that they are interested in? A lot of folks talked about their, for example, their concern for their own kids. Like, I'm concerned about the future of my kids. I don't know how they're gonna make it. With, with housing costs, and not just housing costs, but the, the student loan that they're carrying with this and that, I, I'm really concerned about that. That's the initial conversation, the vision that you want. And for some of you who are on Housing California's, um, for, for Housing California's um, uh, unconference, and not uh, um, did this beginning presentation, and she always does this, but I think it's really effective. She puts the, the, the brownie box on the thing, right? It's like, stop, like, don't be selling the recipe on the back of the box, which is all the policy stuff. Right, you want to sell the vision, the beautiful brownie that's in front. Tell, right, have people first envision what it is they want. Put in front of them, you want you want this beautiful thing on the front, right? You gotta buy the the cake box, the the things that sort of gets get you there. And it doesn't mean you can't talk about policy, but there is an order to that conversation. The order is the vision, the brownie on the front of the box. You want a community where people are not, you know, shuffling and 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 and, and you know potentially on the street just to be able to have a place to stay and work. That'll make it right. That's the vision you want. Oh, now that we've bought into that, now let's talk about how we get there. Well, policy is involved. And once you do that, people are willing to lean in and wade through some hard stuff if they believe in the vision. But if they don't believe in the, if they're not there with the vision, they don't, they don't want to read the back of the box. They don't want to read the recipe. If I don't want that brownie, I'm not, I'm not reading the recipe. I don't care what the hell the damn thing says, right? So anyway. We've got a, a video clip of that brownie metaphor. If anyone wants to see it again, uh, we'll, we'll send that. Um, here, here's a question from Rachel, who's a social movement scholar, and notes that one of the predictors of the most powerful movements is a very clear solution like desegregate public spaces. Is there an agreement here about what our short, pithy solution that we should be pushing forward is? And she also, she notes, um, you know, it's not the message, but um, the, the clear ask in the LG, uh, LGBTQI movement was, give us the right to marry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I, I don't know that we, I don't know that our project sort of got that far, right? But I do think we've had lots of conversations about this, the steering committee around this issue. Do we need to have one broad kind of set of slogans or one broad umbrella campaign that where there are slots that you can fit into that, right? So it doesn't mean that we all have to be pushing for the same policy, but there is a way in which you can have one of those big, broad kind of umbrella messages. We did not create that for this project. It doesn't preclude us from being able to do that, um, but that, that requires kind of another layer of thinking and another right, layer of development and conversation. But what this tries to do is for a whole range of things, right? What are some of the what, what are some of the things that we know that work in terms of the elements of narrative that we would want to include? So if we were to do that, like to build a sort of campaign out of this, that was one big aspirational campaign, right? Um, now, we, now we have the playbook that would help us to understand what are some of those elements that we're going to, like, like slot one, we need to make sure we're naming the moment, how do we do that? We'll talk to, so we have that piece of it. Um, I'm not opposed to it. I think lots of folks in the steering committee were struggling with whether we should or not. If people want to see that. I think there's opportunities to develop that. Yeah, and I just, I really want to encourage folks who are here who are going to be part of this work to really keep thinking about that. I mean, that that has been such a challenge. Um, you know, every, every advocacy issue thinks that they're the biggest onion and they've got the most complicated one, but like, I really do think we've got the biggest onion. We've got the most layers to unpack. It is challenging. And some folks in the chat box said, um, decommodify housing, which, um, I, you know, I'll just share my own experiences, even when I'm sitting with affordable housing wonks, we sit in a room and people are like, well, what does that mean? So, you know, just like really trying to like keep unpacking and keep unpacking, like what is, what are we going for and how do we say it in a way like, um, you know, uh, our an original question originator, like give us the right to marry. No one was like, well, what does it mean to get married? Like everybody knew right. what it meant. So, um, right. um, and then there's, you yeah. know, Right yeah, and I would, yeah, and I want I want to say something about that decommodified house because I think I think that is right on target, right? I mean, really, and and one of the things we, we didn't we weren't as, as as explicit about in the playbook, but as deeply embedded here is that we're we're, un, 
we're trying we're, we're trying to unseat a lot of these dominant narratives by by some of that affirmative framing so un, un, decommodifying housing is not just only about saying um it's not it's not just saying uh, uh like stop making housing just about your ability to pay for it like we got to get beyond that but if you look at those those value propositions, those are steps in the process of decommodifying housing. Housing is not just about the, the the equity that I'm building up so that I can go off to retirement, which is a lot of the way that people think about it. Like I'm building up enough equity so I can go off and retire at some point. This is an investment that in my own life that then has to carry me through to retirement. Yeah, for some people it, that for some people who are who were lucky enough, right, <laughs> lucky enough to buy it, they may have that. But housing is about so much more than that. You don't have your health and well-being, right, in the way that you should have if you don't have a stable place to live. That conversation is undermining this idea that housing is simply about the commodity or about how we buy and sell and what we get as, right? It's about something more than that, right? And so every time we talk about that, the legacy we're leaving for our kids means housing is actually more than that. Housing Right, putting people for housing is actually more than that. And it is slowly sort of chipping away at the dominance of this narrative as housing being about right, our ability to make some dollars, you invest and then you get money back on the back end like that, which we're slowly sort of chipping away at that as a dominant narrative. Thank you. More, more ideas in the chat box. Let's keep this conversation going, folks. We need your ideas. Um, Here's a question about sort of the coalition building process and um, a specific ask. What are messages and ways to include the education community? How do we intentionally illuminate the value and impact of inclusive and integrated community on other health outcomes? How do we build a strategic coalition so the conversation is broader than housing as a simple yet complex isolated issue? Totally. And I, and I just want to reinforce, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad that that's the question that came right after our last question. Because I would say, if you want to grow the coalition beyond housing, I'm going to say something that's going to be very unpopular. Housing might not even be in the title of it. Get out. Get out of here. No. I mean, when you think about successful sort of movement building, it's bigger than that. Like, even or not, what you talk about in the call, greater than fear, right? And then within that, there's a slot for folks who do work in education, a slot for folks who do work in housing, but the larger sort of animating campaign around that is much bigger than that. And you can see some, some of those movements around the country where people are building bigger. Some of the work that I've been involved in, like, you know, Prosperity's Front Door, right? Not, not in housing in the title, but it was a nod to the fact that people were concerned about, right, their ability to like provide for their families and Prosperity was at the front of that. And some of that was about housing, but it was about more than that. So what I would say is, as you think about a coalition and think about what that bigger, you know, aspirational framing could be for a campaign, you got to build it big enough. You got to build that tent strong, build enough and durable enough that people, like that the United Way sees their stake in it, that the Rotary Club sees their stake in it, that, you know, the largest employer see their stake, like they got to be able to see themselves in it. And a message that sort of sounds like, yeah, if I'm the, if I'm the hospital president, like, I could stand up and deliver that as a message, right? And that's what some of these other movements that we're describing and campaigns that we're describing have at their core. They're big enough as a frame to fit more than just housing in it, even if housing is the central concern that's sort of pushing it. Yeah. Okay, you're rehired. <laughs> um, you know, can I, Ryan, can I put you on the spot? Can you pop back in here? I'd, I'd also love to get your um, reactions on this sort of widening coalition, given your role working with artists and, I mean, just the way you speak at large with so many audiences. Any reactions to that question? Ah, uh, yeah. My, I was writing some stuff in the chat, um, but as we were thinking about the name for this particular project, uh, knowing that it's housing justice at the center, we knew that we'd be engaging people who were involved in all kinds of different issues or just artists who weren't really particularly thinking directly about housing justice, but um, we knew that we'd have people who were impacted um, by housing insecurity and so on and so forth, just by proxy of their elected you know choice of work or or whatever um and so you know the question continues to come up about us envisioning our futures um us envisioning the places that we want to be 
And uh, the more we sat at the table, and there was three of us just kind of batting around ideas, the more we came to the synonymous, uh, you know, name for like a healthy place to be, which is a haven, right? Um, and we realized that that was kind of an all-encompassing umbrella that could engage re-entry population, um, that could engage, you know, people talking about food justice, that could engage, I mean, we're talking about a healthy community, a good community, and it's subjective enough for people to imagine it on their own, that we're not imposing our idea about what good community is or what a community mattering means or whatever, um, that there is space for people to imagine um, and there is a positive reinforcement for them to think about what, um, what is to gain while they consider uh, what is lost in the current um, manifestation of, of our visioning. Thanks. I just remembered at a session, oh, it must've been months ago because we were all in person, Gloria Bruce with a group of people, I don't remember who else was in her group, came up with the, the message around like, I, I wanna live in a city that loves me back as much as I love my city or something like that. And I think about that statement all the time. So. I don't know where we go from there, but I wanted to share it because it was so profound. The other thing I want to offer really briefly is, um, and Amy just reiterated it in the chat, is, you know, we're constantly talking about housing, affordable housing. And, you know, when I envision that just as an artist, you know, I'm thinking of the, the same projects that were erected, you know, 50 years ago. Um, but when I think of a home, I think of something altogether different. Um, I think of the place that I grew up. I think of you know, family, I think of neighborhoods, I think of safe spaces, I think of schools. I mean, there's just a whole other way that we envision homeness as opposed to housing. Um, and so that's, you know, just an interesting way to invite people into the conversation as well as to think of words that are kind of tangential to housing, um, but, you know, are broader and, and engage just a different level of thinking. Thanks, Ryan. And uh, Laundry's dropped that link back in the chat box if folks want to keep, um, be reminded of where to go to get more engaged in Haven. It's going to be so great. I can't wait. Um, okay, I'm going to go back to some of these questions here. I think we could keep talking about this question, and we're going to keep talking about this question, but just in the, the goal of answering some of these other questions and um, acknowledging that, you know, we, we can dig more into that specific question at um, upcoming sessions as well. So let's, um, let's go back to this uh, QA box. And I think this is a really great question um, from an anonymous attendee. How do we combat skepticism in the idea that government can change things given where we are today? Yeah, with, with real world examples that it's working, that there's work that's happening and talking to folks about the fact that uh, it just needs scale, right? So. Um, and, and I would say, you know, we, there, there is a kind of rethinking that we need to take this thing off the assembly line and like figure it out first, then put it back. But, but there is a, but cynicism is often challenged by people seeing things happen. One of the good things about the conversations we have with folks is that everybody, it's funny, people could name like an affordable housing development. Oh yeah, over there by so-and-so, they build up this good, there's going to be affordable units. And so people could name, like they could see affordable housing they build, they have, so it wasn't that they couldn't, they couldn't see it, but they don't understand why that energy is not solving the thing, right? So I said, seeing like building happening all over the Bay and they got some stuff over here and some stuff over there. But so, so the, the cynicism is coming from just the, the magnitude of what's happening. So giving them a sense of what is happening, sharing that that work needs more scale, that we need to scale that up because the magnitude of the macro issues we're trying to combat through the housing space are so large that it requires a bigger container that we than, than we have had access to. Um, and then talking about what some of those barriers are, what are the barriers to scale, right? Um, do we have the right developers in the conversation? Are, is there motivation around some, you know, equity of, of, of concern? Or are they just building for the sake of building? I mean, there are a whole series of things, but telling people what are the barriers beyond just, right, the sense of scale. Um, I hope that's helpful. I mean, it's just really, when, when people, when you, when you force people to think about the fact that it's working and that they, they can actually name places where affordable housing is being built, where people are actually getting access to what they need, but it just needs more scale. Like, okay, well, 
yeah, I guess so. Well, how do we get there? What are the barriers to scale? Let's talk about that and then help us figure out, right, how to get to scale. <laughs> um, and I would say for a lot of the organizations on this call, you know, to be able to say, you know, hey, listen, you know, we have a nonprofit, you know, housers, right? We have a track record of understanding how to do this and do this well, but we need more scale. If we have more support, we could do the thing that helps us to get to a different kind of place and surrounding. Um, so talking about that in much more depth is very helpful for getting people up and over cynicism as a challenge. And that that is important and it's huge. So so not to undermine that conversation, it is huge and you got to get people up and over it. You know, it also makes me think back to sort of how you laid out the playbook, having really recognizing that depending on where people are coming from, having different strategies and how you communicate with them. I'm just thinking about people who right now have a very like people who are very distrustful of our government, largely because of their reaction to the national administration, um, maybe it would feel sort of um, flippant just to be like, we've got a great track record. We could like lean in to be like, yeah, we don't like the way things are either. Let's change them. Let's make it better. And then people who are like feeling um, like, you know, maybe there's, you know, they're, they're less, they're less in that place. Like just having that different strategy, having that different approach to saying like, oh, like let us look at what we have done and how we scale. So I just, I really want to highlight that because I, I heard from a lot of people looking at the playbook and my own reaction, that piece in the playbook where you lay out like the, I think the section is called putting all the pieces together. And it's like, these are all the different strategies. You don't have to use all of them with everybody all the time. Like really think about who are you talking to in this moment um, right. and, and using, using the tools that you have available to you. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me, um, let me share this question. Um, one of the dominant narratives we hear is about the mom and pop landlords, and this is from Deborah from Monument Impact. We hear about mom and pop landlords who are suffering as much as tenants, especially under COVID-19. How do we counter this narrative and try to help smaller landlords see their interdependence and role within housing justice? Can we turn them from contrarians to persuadables and then with us? Wait, say that, say that again. I think I, I, think I lost the, the thread of that. Um, the dominant narrative is mom and pop landlords who are also suffering under COVID. Mm -hmm. So how do we help those smaller landlords see their interdependence and role within housing justice? Right. I think, I think the, you're, through the question, you're naming exactly what, it, what you have to do, which is what, is that, what, is, what do they have at stake in this conversation? What are they, not, what are they, lo what are they losing by not joining with us around these issues? It's that loss of version for them, right? What are they not getting that they would be able to get if they joined arms right, with us and lean forward on this kind of conversation? Um, a large reason why bystanders are leaning out is because they don't, they don't, they're not quite sure what they get out of this conversation. They're afraid that they're going to lose something if they join with us versus if they continue to sit out, right? So in order to get them off the fence, like, listen, every day that you are not leaning into this conversation, mom and pop landlord, you're actually losing the ability to, to protect the thing that you want, which is, right, the property that you have. So, so talking about that is really important. Thank you. Here's a question from Iris um, from Housing California. Um, we heard from Lake Research that the public doesn't want to hear that historical exclusionary laws have laid the foundation for the injustices today. They just want to talk about the future. How do we soften that resistance? How much should we talk about it now? Is glossing over it enough? Do we gauge it depending on the target audience? What do you recommend in terms of bringing our goals, our racial justice goals forward in a climate that's saying the general public maybe isn't, doesn't want to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I want to say, I mean, that was a, so thanks, Iris. I think that's exactly right. A couple things about that. I think that was, that was exactly right. And let, let me just put this in context. You know, what polling research provides to you is a temperature check on where people are today, right? So where they are today, it's harder to get that kind of messaging across. They're, they're willing to go the conversation about no matter where you're from, no matter where that we all deserve, a, they're willing to go there. Um, but they have a hard time when you want to talk about the fact that, hey, listen, folks, it's been unequal and uneven and unfair for a very long time, <laughs> right? Um, and so, so that's the temperature of what it is today. I, from my vantage point, we're in a moment where there's a possibility of unseating that, the narrative that this is just something that we can kind of roll forward. 
So the conversation in the playbook specifically gives you a little bit of that narrative to start chipping away at, the, at, at what is what right now is not a whole lot of support for having that long-term conversation. And you notice the playbook, there's not a long sort of dissertation about, I mean, and I, sometimes I go to these presentations and people are really into, they want to give you the whole history. They want to give you the full, like, color of law, Richard Rothstein analysis, like, you know, in the presentation. No, people are not going to sit around for, a lo you know, most of them, not, unless they're really just interested in this conversation already. They're not likely to sit through a whole Richard Rothstein, like, presentation from the very beginning, how we, you know, or, you know, a, a stamp from the very beginning, which is like, you know, some, some great work from some of my, my their colleagues who talk about racial justice. But most folks can take a little bit of that. And I will say, from my vantage point, you, we have to start seeing the idea of the context. Otherwise, you'll never get people to eventually lean into that conversation. So the, some of the language in the playbook is an intentional effort to get more of that context in the conversation and to position it in a way that is forward thinking. So if you look at that language, it's we have to acknowledge where we've come from. This work that we're invested in today is, a, is an intentional effort to address some of these issues that have not, right? And then, to, and, then and then quickly sort of moving into that forward thinking kind of positioning. Um, but I would say, listen, you, you've, got, you've got to start chipping away at that, at the res, at the, at the, uh, the challenges that people hold about having that conversation slowly but surely. Um, if we're not, we're not shifting the narrative, right? We're not shifting people. We're not moving people in the direction of how we have the conversation. You'll also notice in the examples for the base, for the bystanders, and then for the, uh, you know, contrarians, that there's a little bit of a softer touch. So for the contrarians, there's a centering of that conversation about equity and a little bit of that history, but it's very light touch because they're not, you know, we just, you know, some of those folks are not sticking around for that whole conversation, but you got to get some of that in there. For the persuadables, they're willing to hear a little bit more of that so you can get a little bit more body. And for the base, like take it home. Like this is, these are folks who already believe what we believe, but having them embrace this conversation about the context in which this is happening is really important. Um, I'd also say that one of the things that was found in the late research and that I've just from personal experience will say is true, that if you really want to get people of color in this conversation and you want them to understand that, that to, to, to link arms with you, you have to acknowledge like what's happened. You know, there, there's something about that that is freeing. Like, that's how I know I can trust you because you're saying to me, this is not, the, you know, you recognize this is not what's happening right here in the Bay Area right now in the contemporary space. It's not the only time we've had this happen. This has been a long time coming and a long, and a lot of folks have been hurt because of our inability to get this right. And when I hear you talk about that, now I'm going to lean in more because I, I trust you because I know that you, you've acknowledged kind of what's happened. If you don't have that acknowledgement, even folks who do, do traumatic experiences and, 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 and trauma-informed care, that acknowledgement, it matters, right? In terms of people, your ability to get people to trust you. So you got to, that statement is like, let me just say, I, I get it. Some of y'all are just coming to this conversation about equity, but let me tell you, it extends way beyond what's been happening since 1992. I was like, you know, a lot of us have been dealing with this, this sort of injustice around housing for a very long time, for generations, and if you don't say it, if you don't acknowledge it, I don't know that I trust that you're really serious about it. So there is a little bit of that balance. And so in the playbook, you see, we're hedging that a little bit. For the base, give it to them hard. For the persuadables, give them enough that, that, that they will lean into it, maybe even ask for more information. For the contrarians, for the contrarians, give them a little bit too. Because hell, at this point, they're you know they're not coming around anyway. Like you know, they're not they're not moving in our direction anyway. Um, at very least, they walk away with a stronger sense of like what it is that we're talking about and why equity is important for us in the conversation. There's so many plus ones in the chat box to that. Thank you. That I think that's really illuminating and so important for us to remember. Like, what is the role of research? And that was so true in how the playbook was created. It's not, it wasn't just going out and doing a bunch of research and being like, here it is, packaging up. But it was like using the research for what the research can offer, getting practitioner perspective, get like workshopping things, doing the local aid of the land, looking at our audiences. And like, it's such a good reminder. I think there's some people who put too little uh, trust in science and facts and research and some of us who maybe go a little too far being like the research says. So that's a great reminder. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's still a lot of chatter too in the chat box about like trying to find that thing, that thing we can say and point us to. And our last question here in the, the QA box from Nina, I think is a, a little bit pointing to something in the playbook as an option too. What about this fairness across places phrase that you use in the amplify value section? What, what, what does that refer to? Is that cities being part of the bigger solution? Is that something else? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that. That is this conversation that is really a nod to regionalism, which is, you know, folks, folks will say, well, they, they'll understand why in their neighborhood or their community that they should be thinking about the housing around them. They get very worked up about that, but they don't understand why they should be concerned about somebody else's housing way across the other side of the bay. Do I care about what the North Bay folks are doing? Do I care about what's happening? In, right, right. They don't, they don't get that. Like we're all kind of in this ecosystem together. And housing is an infrastructure in investment. It is one that you're actually in this thing together, but the way that people think about it is, I gotta be concerned just about what's around my little, my little place. Um, and so when you start to just to talk about, well, that, that person's housing over there, well, I think, well, I'm really sorry for them, but I don't live in that neighborhood, so I don't. But what happens is, and we did a lot of, a lot of work research around this, when you start talking about the fairness across places, should you be disadvantaged because you live over there? Because you don't know. Every neighborhood should, should have a great school to go to for the kids. They should have a great, you know, um, they should have great resources for health and wellness and well-being. They should have, right, when you start to talk about that and the fact that so many communities don't have those, the, the, the things that they need, enough housing for folks that people are poor, their, their sense of justice kind of kicks in when you start having that conversation. Yeah, there shouldn't be any reason why Right, so it's it's both those issues. It's thinking about it as a broader, having us identify as a broader region and what it takes for us to be healthy together as a region because what happens over in that neighborhood actually affects me. And then it's also about the fairness about what's in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood and in that neighborhood. Don't we all need complete kind of holistic neighborhoods and how do we get there? So those two things in common help us, right, that sort of fairness across places. To, to, to have a different conversation, have people leaning in a different way. Yeah. This is so wonderful. Thank you, Dr. T. Uh, I'm gonna gratefully jump in before more cues pop into the chat box because I know they're coming and I wanna remind folks, please make sure you've registered for session two, which is gonna go really deep on the research. I know there were people in the chat box saying, well, hang on, you're giving me the recommendation. I wanna hear more about where it came from. Sessions two is where you're going to get that glimmer and glimpse into everything we learned and how these um, recommendations came to be. And yeah. session three, where we're going to go deeper on um, application and really thinking through what this looks like in your work and how we can do this together and we can continue this conversation about some of those joint phrases. Mm -hmm. I also, um, for all of us with the interest in Haven, I want I do want to make a plug at the NPH conference. We have a um, we have a practitioner panel, including Ryan, as well as Catherine Gracie from Tech Equity and Deborah Ballinger from Monument Impact, really giving um, real world examples of how they have been applying and utilizing that work. And so that would be a great place to see and learn more from that perspective. Um, I think registration deadline is tomorrow for that. So please don't, don't wait on that. And, um, and then, as we mentioned earlier, the CZI Learning Lab is a great collaborative add-on opportunity to keep building tactical skills around narrative. Um, I want to give Ryan a couple minutes before we go and then Dr. T, I'll let you close this out. Thank you, Alina. You can see me over here waving. I'm just going to share something in the link. There's a reason why this song really resonates and you watch it at your own time, but we talk about, we're talking about home, seeing all the conversations happen in the chat. And so um, just listen to these lyrics because it's, she doesn't talk about a roof in as much as she talks about a place. Have a great one. Thanks, Ryan. Any, any closing comments from you, Dr. T, before I put the NPH Spotify playlist back on? No, I, I was going to say my, my final comment. I'm glad that there's so many comments where people want to know, kind of not, not just the playbook, but where some of the recommendations come from. Um, and I would say for session two, you don't, you don't want to miss it. Not only will we have all the you know, researchers on the call, talking through kind of how we got here. Um, but even, for, you know, we'll give you a treat to ha be able to listen to it and look at 
some of the actual footage that we did from the community voice sessions where some of the recommendations come forward particularly in a, in a particular useful way. And so you get a chance to see like all the interesting things that like their, their residents are talking about and, and, and why, you know, the recommendations are what they are. When you see that, I would say, you know, for, for the steering committee and folks who had a chance to participate in some of those community voice sessions, you know, it was a sobering experience um, uh, for, for all of us and, and, and both sobering in the sense of like really what we're up against and what we're looking at, but also the need to be strategic about how we address different pieces, which you see represented in the playbook. So you don't want to miss that session too. We'll be here next Wednesday at the same time, uh, giving you even more kind of information about how we, how we got to those recommendations and what they mean for your work. Thanks so much, Dr. T. Thanks everyone for joining us.